It's May 1919, and troop ships carrying thousands of British soldiers arrive at the Arctic Russian port of Arhangelsk. They've come to replace American soldiers who are about to return home, because the United States is unilaterally withdrawing from intervention in the civil war in North Russia. The polar bear expedition is over. Hi, I'm Jesse Alexander and welcome to The Great War. In May 1919, the Russian Civil War was still raging and the Allied intervention forces had been in northern Russia for over a year. Yet there was still no unified policy about what they hoped to achieve there or in the other intervention zones in the south and east. The 5,000 men of the American Expeditionary Force North Russia, better known as the Polar Bear Expedition, were preparing to go home after spending 10 months fighting the Bolsheviks and the harsh climate. Many were asking themselves the same question that we're going to start with today. Why had they been sent there in the first place? Now before we dive into the story of the polar bears, if you want an in-depth look at the Russian Civil War and the wider Allied intervention in early 1919, check out our February episode. But for now we're going to concentrate on the American role in the intervention in North Russia. Now there's been some debate about why US President Woodrow Wilson agreed to send American troops to Russia at all given his strong beliefs about non-intervention and self-determination. Now, most Soviet historians interpreted US intervention as a planned attempt by the United States to topple the young Bolshevik government. But this argument has largely fallen out of favor with European and American scholars. Most Western historians generally agree that the US did not send troops to North Russia on ideological grounds, but because of international political pressure from France and especially from Britain. Now, Wilson was, from the beginning, extremely reluctant to send U.S. troops into the Russian chaos. An aid memoir that he wrote in July 1918 stated, The U.S. is not in a position, and has no expectation of being in a position, to take part in organized intervention in adequate force from either Vladivostok or Murmansk or Arhangelsk. Intervention there would add to the present sad confusion in Russia rather than cure it. But the same document also allowed that American troops could be deployed to guard ports, steady the country, and provide some help to the Czechoslovak Legion if the Allied Supreme War Council so decided. This reflected Wilson's uncertainty, which he himself admitted. It is a matter of the most complex and difficult sort, and I have at no time felt confident in my own judgment about it. Now, Wilson wasn't the only high-ranking American with such misgivings. Secretary of War Newton Baker thought, the expedition was complete nonsense from the beginning. Many generals were also against the idea, and Army Chief of Staff Peyton March called it a serious military mistake. In spite of his reluctance, Wilson finally agreed to send US troops to North Russia and Siberia in the fall of 1918, in order to support the wartime alliance against Germany. The units selected for the expedition were three battalions of the 339th Infantry Regiment from Michigan, along with supporting units of engineers, a field hospital, and an ambulance company, all of which were placed under the command of Colonel Stewart. They arrived in Arhangas in September 1918, joining a mixed force of a few thousand British, French, Polish, Serb, and White Russian troops responsible for a vast and remote region that was not a priority for the Whites or for the Reds. The fighting was limited by the harsh terrain and climate to isolated villages along the Arhangas Vologda Railroad and along the northern Dvina River. Influenza, pneumonia, and frostbite soon began to take their toll, even before the fighting began. And it soon became clear that the situation on the ground would be quite different than Wilson's idea of guarding port warehouses. For one thing, the American ambassador to Russia, David Francis, was a staunch interventionist and interpreted Wilson's aide memoir in a much more aggressive tone than had been intended. For another, the US troops were under British command, and the British were not under such a restrictive policy as their minister for war, Winston Churchill, was in favor of fighting the Bolsheviks, or bolos as the men called them. One doughboy wrote bitterly, We're getting dirty stunts pulled on us by the low-down English. The Russians have no use for the English. I haven't seen anybody yet that did. Almost immediately upon their arrival, the Americans were sent into combat and played a key role in several battles that fall. This, along with the British involvement in a coup in the local white Russian government, prompted the US to send a reminder note to its allies that all military effort in northern Russia must be given up except the guarding of the ports themselves. 
but the messages from Washington had little effect on the chaos on the ground. British commanders simply did not have enough troops to go around, and the American units continued to see action alongside British forces. For several days starting on November 11th, the so-called Armistice Day battle raged near the village of Tulgas on the northern Dvina River. After the battle, Canadian veterans introduced the inexperienced Americans to the ways of war. An American officer recalled, The Canadians taught our boys their first lesson in looting the persons of the dead. Our men had been rather respectful and gentle with the Bolo dead, who were quite numerous. But the Canadians, veterans of four years fighting, immediately went through the pockets of the dead for rubles or knives, and even took the boots off the dead, as they were pretty fair boots. The news from the Western Front was cold comfort to the polar bears. In the words of another officer, the men knew they were doomed to a desperate winter, armistice or no armistice. Now, once the fighting stopped on the Western Front, the Allies could no longer justify the intervention in anti-German terms, but there was no agreed policy for continuing to fight in Russia. So the polar bears continued to fight in small-scale actions in the dead of winter. In mid-January, the Bolshevik 6th Army attacked Allied positions at the village of Shenkursk, about 200 kilometers south of Arhangelsk. The Americans were in the thick of the attack, and desperately held off the enemy in deep snow and temperatures which dropped to 37 degrees below freezing. In an ominous sign, the white Russian artillerymen supporting the American troops had fled their guns and had to be forced back at gunpoint during the fighting. Badly outnumbered and surrounded on three sides, the Allied forces retreated to a defensive line farther north. American officer John Moore described the conditions of the withdrawal this way. To run was impossible. To halt was worse yet, and so nothing remained but to plunge and flounder through the snow in mad desperation, with a prayer on our lips to gain the edge of our fortified positions. In March, American, British and white Russian forces attacked the strategic village of Balshia Azyorki. Struggling against the deep snow and enemy fire, the advance stalled and the Bolsheviks counterattacked unsuccessfully before withdrawing. The spring thaw was about to begin, which would prevent either side from launching any major offensive. Now, as the fighting continued, it seemed back in Washington that Wilson was still unclear as to the extent of what was actually happening on the ground. In February, he still maintained, We are not at war with Russia, and will in no circumstances take part in military operations there. So although combat in the freezing Russian Arctic continued after the November 11th armistice, Back in the US, the public grew frustrated with the never-ending intervention in Russia. Once Germany had been defeated, neither the soldiers nor their relatives back home could see much point in continuing to fight the Bolsheviks so far from home. As winter dragged on and the fight against the Bolsheviks and the weather continued, morale began to suffer amongst all the Allied forces in North Russia, and in early 1919 there were small-scale mutinies amongst British, French, White Russian and American troops. U.S. Sergeant Silver Parrish, who was later decorated for bravery in combat, recorded some of his feelings about the conflict and the extreme poverty of the Russian peasants. The way these kids and women dress would make you laugh if you saw it on the stage. But to see it here only prompts sympathy in the heart of a real man and loathing for a clique of blood-sucking, power-loving, capitalistic, lying, thieving, murdering Tsarist army officials who keep their people in this ignorance and poverty. The majority of the people here are in sympathy with the Bolo, and I don't blame them. In fact, I am nine-tenths Bolo myself. Parrish even wrote his commanding officer to ask, why we are fighting the Bolos, and why we haven't any big guns, and why the English run us, and why we haven't enough to eat, and why our men can't get proper medical attention and some mail. Even the officers were affected. Lieutenant Kudahi, who later served as US ambassador to several countries and interviewed Hitler in 1941, bemoaned the uncertainty of the long wait for orders to return home. No word comes, and the soldier is left to think that he has been abandoned by his country and left to rot on the barren snow wastes of Arctic Russia. Back home in the US, soldiers' families began to mobilize to bring the boys home. Relatives formed the Detroit's own welfare group to agitate for the withdrawal of the troops and held protest meetings at local churches in early February. They collected signatures in a petition, which was sent to Congress, and lobbied for their cause via the press. A soldier's wife wrote a local paper, Of course they can't know why they are fighting. No one does. How long must we people of this democratic land stand for this? 
Soon, political figures in Washington, especially isolationist Republicans opposed to Wilson's engagements in Europe, took up the cause. Senator Hiram Johnson launched a campaign he called America for America First on April 4th and raised the issue in Congress, saying, Our supineness, our cowardice, is risking 5,000 precious American lives in Russia without a plan, scheme, or purpose. With morale falling and unrest at home, President Wilson would have to decide what to do about the polar bears. Amidst growing pressure in the US and with no coherent Russia strategy emerging from the peace conference, President Wilson had already decided to end the expedition and bring the troops home in late winter. On February 18th, he sent a note to the Allies demanding the prompt withdrawal of American and Allied troops in North Russia at the earliest possible moment that weather conditions will permit in the spring. Now this decision was not fully known in Russia or to the American public until mid-April, when American Brigadier General Wilds Richardson arrived to coordinate the evacuation, which was completed by July. The polar bear expedition and the American intervention in North Russia was over, even though other Allied troops remained and American forces stayed on in Siberia. A local Detroit newspaper gleefully remarked as the troops returned, when once American opinion had become convinced that the polar bears ought to be withdrawn from northern Russia, no power on earth could keep them there, Bolsheviki or no Bolsheviki. And though the polar bears were back and had been welcomed with a ticker tape parade, not all had returned safely. The Arctic campaign had cost 218 American lives, many from disease and 305 wounded. Resentment over the deployment and loss of American life was still lingering among some veterans. As one officer wrote in his diary, When the last battalion set sail from Archangel, not a soldier knew, no, not even vaguely, why he had fought or why his comrades were left behind. So many of them beneath the wooden crosses. Now that we followed the story of the polar bear expedition to its conclusion in early summer 1919, it's time for our roundup segment where we catch up on what else is going on in May 1919. So let's start in Europe, where on May 1st and 2nd, German government and Freikorps troops occupied Munich and brought an end to the three-week-old Bavarian Soviet Republic. Not far away, on May 9th, the Hungarian Red Army launched a counter-offensive against Czechoslovak forces in Slovakia and Upper Hungary. By the 20th, the Hungarians had driven the Czechs back, separated them from the Romanian troops to the east, and reached the pre-1918 border. On the 30th, a counter-revolutionary Hungarian government was established in the French-occupied city of Szeged, with former Austro-Hungarian Admiral Miklos Horthy as Minister for War. That same day, at the peace conference in Paris, Belgium was granted a mandate over part of the former German colony in East Africa, today the territory of Rwanda and Burundi. Also this month, the British charity Save the Children was launched by Eglantine Jeb in order to help German and Austrian children suffering from disease and starvation as a result of the ongoing Allied blockade. Turning to the former Russian Empire, on May 7th, local warlord Nikifor Grigoryev and his peasant troops rebelled against their Bolshevik allies because of the war communism policy, weakening the Red Army position in Ukraine. Also in May, white Russian and British forces attacked along the Murmansk Railway towards Petrograd, but were stopped short of their objective near Petrozavodsk. On the 25th, the Estonian and white Russian troops advanced eastwards against the Red Army and captured the city of Pskov. In international news, on May 4th, the May 4th movement began in China, sparked by student protests against what they saw as the Chinese government's weak stance against Japanese demands for Chinese territory at the Paris Peace Conference. On May 6th, the Third Anglo-Afghan War, known in Afghanistan as the War of Independence, broke out when Afghan forces under Emir Amanullah Khan invaded British India to free Afghanistan of British control of its foreign policy and secure Khan's position as Emir. On the 15th, the Winnipeg General Strike broke out in Canada. High unemployment and revolutionary sentiments amongst some unionists caused workers to strike for six weeks after negotiations over better working conditions broke down. Also on the 15th, Greek troops landed at the Ottoman city of Smyrna. The Greeks had been invited to occupy part of Western Turkey by British Prime Minister David Lloyd George, who wanted to limit Italian influence in the region and was sympathetic to Greek hopes of extending control over the large Greek-speaking minority along the Aegean coast. Almost immediately, violence broke out against Muslim residents as Greeks and other Christians sought revenge for wartime oppression at the hands of the Turks. 
the atrocities shocked the Allies and outraged the Turks, who formed local militias. On the 19th, Turkish commander Mustafa Kemal arrived in Samsung to begin organizing a new Turkish army to expel the Greek and Allied occupation forces. The Greco-Turkish War, or the Turkish War of Independence, had begun. As usual, you can find all our sources for this episode in the video description, including links to our Amazon stores. If you want to learn a bit more about the British and Commonwealth forces that served in the Allied intervention in Russia, we interviewed Damien Wright, author of Churchill's Secret War with Lenin, in our supporter podcast a few weeks ago. Now, to get access to the podcast and support our show, go to patreon.com slash thegreatwar or click the join button below this video. Our supporters can also suggest topics and ask us questions. In fact, this episode was inspired by multiple patrons who asked us about the polar bear expedition. I'm Jesse Alexander and this is The Great War 1919, a production of real-time history and the only YouTube history channel that only intervenes with a clear mission.